So the objective for today, at the end of this webinar, you should be able to understand the utility of a risk assessment tool to identify children and adolescents for targeted TB testing and evaluation, implement age-specific approaches for administering TB medications to children, and utilize strategies for overcoming barriers and achieving adherence. And my name is Patty Woods. I will be your moderator for today. And I'd like to introduce our faculty. Um, this is uh, Lillian Farag, and she is our pediatric nurse practitioner here at the Global TB Institute, along with Suzanne Tortorello, and she is an advanced practice nurse. And they are going to give you their um, great experience that they've had with pediatric TB. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to speak with you. And I will uh, review all the issues related to uh, testing in children. And then Lillian will discuss in detail about ministering medication. And we will discuss DOT. And we also will discuss some cases. So we'll begin with targeted TB testing recommendations. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends targeted TB testing only in high-risk groups. This includes contacts of persons with infectious TB, recent immigrants from endemic regions of the world, those with recent travel to endemic regions of the world, and or significant contact with indigenous persons from these areas, incarcerated adolescents, and HIV-infected children or adolescents. Now, I just want to make a couple of comments uh, relative to this slide that oftentimes we have children refer to us who have been tested who don't come from high-risk areas of the world, and that always presents a, an issue. Um, so we only want to test those children who come from high-risk situations, um, because then you're at, with a dilemma if you have a positive skin test and a child coming from a non-endemic area of the world. Um, and I will discuss a little later about the different types of testing we, we do and how that helps to uh, alleviate some of the issues relative to children who were tested who perhaps didn't need to be tested. So what are the risk assessment tools? It helps decide which children are at risk for latent TB infection and TB disease. Uh, TB testing using the TST or tuberculin skin test, the MAN2, or the interferon gamma release assay, we call IGRAS can be uh, targeted at these at-risk children. Uh, the AAP indicates that some data support use of IGRIS in children as young as three years of age. And from my experience um, using IGRIS, we are finding that this is certainly anecdotally valid in the younger children. And I say that because we've had children with TB disease whose IGRA does come back positive, as well as the TB skin test. So I think it's a, a valid tool uh, that we are using more and more in this younger age group. Um, some experts like us are using the IGRIS in children two to four years of age, especially with the BCG history. And the CDC recommends the use of IGRA in all situations where the TST is indicated. IGRIS are preferred for all persons greater than five years of age who have received BCG. And there's the, according to uh, Red Book, the TST is the preferred test for children less than five years of age. But as I said earlier, we are finding more and more in practice that we are using the IGRA in the younger children. Okay. And this is a, a picture of a young child that's in our clinic um, that we are administering medication to. And it's in a comfortable atmosphere where the child feels comfortable with, the, with the nurse sitting there, Lillian sitting there, not standing above the child. And it makes the child feel much more at ease, especially in the mother's arms. <clears throat> so what are risk assessment tools? A risk of exposure to TB should be assessed at routine health care evaluations. Uh, we use a risk assessment questionnaire. Only children with an increased risk of acquiring TB infection or disease should be considered for testing. 
it is important to check the child's immunization records for live vaccines. That would include the MMR and the varicella uh, before you would do a TST or IGRA. If, in fact, the child had those vaccines within the last four weeks, you would have to uh, wait at least four to six weeks following the vaccine before you would uh, do the IGRA or the TST. And you can do them simultaneously. So if the child's at a pediatrician's office and they get immune live vaccines, if the test is indicated at that point in time, the IGRA or the TST, that is when you could do it with the vaccine. But you cannot do it a week or two after because it may affect the results of the test. It may come up with false, false negatives. Okay, the risk assessment questionnaire. Has a family member or contact had TB disease? Has a family member had a positive TB test? Was your child born in a high-risk country? Uh, outside the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, or Western European countries? And there actually are lists available that tell you which countries are not high risk and which are. And then it's important to have those references before you test. And has your tra child traveled to a high-risk country for greater than one week with resident population? This particular uh, question on the questionnaire creates a lot of turmoil in schools because I often get calls from school nurses at the beginning of the school year that some of the children in the school have traveled to endemic countries. Are they obligated to test the child? And what I tell them is, no, it is not your obligation to go around the school and find out where everybody went on their summer vacation and where they stayed. However, if you have a particular concern about a particular child who perhaps doesn't look well, who looks uh, very thin and, and not in a healthy state, you would refer that child to their primary care provider and then follow up with the primary care provider as to what was done as far as the assessment for TB testing. So now we have a polling question. Uh, what additional qu question may you consider as part of a risk assessment? So it seems that we have a very bright audience here because you've all uh, picked all the above. Um, and certainly those are all the concerns that we have about uh, risks for children developing TB disease or TB infection. In fact, the one about raw milk or, or unpasteurized cheese, uh, this year we saw a child who was US born, but uh, the family was from Ethiopia. And the family had gone back for about seven months uh, to live in Ethiopia. And although the, and the child had abdominal TB and did very well with treatment, but the father insisted, insisted that the child had not eaten unpasteurized cheese or milk. However, uh, for seven months, there, there could have been a time when the child was given something to eat uh, by another family member or a family friend, whatever, that um, was unpasteurized. And this child had. Um, abdominal, t you know, M. bovis TB, which we successfully treated. The child did very well with treatment. So it's, a, it's an important question. Okay, the risk assessment questionnaire. Depending on local epidemiology and priorities, other possible questions may include about spending time with one, someone in jail or shelter or someone who's illegally using drugs. And then the second question we already discussed. Um, or is there a household member who was born outside the United States or a household member who recently traveled outside the U.S.? Now, to comment a little bit about this is that we've had a number of children, unfortunately, uh, with TB meningitis. And all of those children that were diagnosed were U.S. born, but they had the risk factor of a household member born outside the United States or a friend of the family living in the household who was born outside the United States. And those people were found to be the index cases who infected these US-born young children who unfortunately developed TB meningitis. So these, this questionnaire is extremely, extremely important in identifying risk factors for children. 
Okay, so when do we use this risk factor uh, assessment? At the first contact with a child and at every six months until age two years. Now that's really referring more to the primary care provider, not to nurses uh, working in a, a TB setting. But certainly it's important for us to have the knowledge that this should be assessed on a regular basis up until the age of two. After the age of two, a risk assessment question every year if possible. And any time the risk of TB is determined, a TST or an IGRA should be performed. And remember, a decision to test a child is a decision to treat. So we don't want anyone testing children and then wondering, is there a quandary over whether or not we should treat this child, because people bring up all kinds of issues why they shouldn't. So our mantra is, if you decide you're going to treat a child, that's a child with risk, then if the child comes to be positive, then you proceed with the assessment for that child. Okay. Transmission of M. tuberculosis to children. Choose, children are usually infected by an adult or adolescent in the immediate household. That's something to remember. It's, it's very often someone right in their own home. Casual extrafamilial contact is much less often the source of infection. Children rarely infect other children or adults. The, the, why? Because children have what we call posse bacillary disease, which means they have few TB bacillus in their bodies. Um, they don't have the kind of cough that we see in adults, although they will cough. But their cough does not have the tussive force to, to cough out the TB bacilli in the air in order to infect other people. So it's very important to remember, especially in school situations, when everyone panics that there might have been a child infected in, uh, that was diagnosed that was attending school. We, we have rarely, if ever, seen transmission in the school setting. And it's important to keep that in mind. Most transmission, I would say 99.9% .9 occurs within the household setting. Okay, let's talk about positive TSD slash IGRA in children. Um, again, we want to take into account the following, the risk of infection, what kind of exposure would there have been, and the risk of progression to disease, which would include the child's immune status and the age. Because we must remember that children who are four and under, and especially infants, those are babies one year and under, are very highly susceptible to developing TD, TB, excuse me, TB disease if they are infected. So those children are at very, very high risk, and we want to test and get them evaluated as soon as possible. And it's up to the clinician if they have a child, um, let's say, with a positive TSC or a, a history of BCG, what the risk of uh, trans going on to be infected to be treated. So uh, it's important to do a very detailed history and assessment with the parent or caregiver to make those clinical decisions. Okay, so how do we evaluate a child with a positive TSC or IGRA? The evaluation of all children with a positive TSC or IGRA should include a careful history. Remember the history is the most important part of your physical, your assessment. A household source case investigation for children four and under. In other words, who is this child around? With? How could this child have become infected? So who lives there or who visits often? A physical exam to look for any signs or symptoms, physical exam signs and symptoms of TB disease. And a, a chest x-ray, PA and lateral uh, for children five and over, and AP and lateral in children four and under. So what do we do about managing children who are contacts of cases? Children who are less than four years old exposed to a person with active tuberculosis need a TB test and a chest x-ray to rule out active disease. Okay, the evaluation should be done within one week. So basically what we're saying is as soon as possible, especially in young children, you want to get those children in for evaluation. Treatment with INH or rifampin is recommended even if the TSC or IGRA is negative. If the TSC or IGRA is negative, retest eight to 10 weeks or when the contact has been broken. So in other words, it has to be eight to 10 weeks post contact with the infected person. If subsequent TSC and IGRA is negative, then you can discontinue the INH. So what we're saying is we put children four and under 
who've been exposed to an infectious TB case on what we call window prophylaxis. Most of the time we're using INH, but you can also use rifampin. Now remember, at this point in time, you don't know about sensitivities because everything is new. The case is new, you're just evaluating context. So you initially put the children on INH or rifampin. You keep them on the medication until the contact is broken or eight, weeks has, eight to 10 weeks has passed by so that the case is no longer infectious. And then you retest the child. If the second testing is negative, you can stop the medication. If the second test is positive, then you know the child's infected and the treatment either continues for nine months for INH or for six months, four, four months, excuse me, we were using uh, six months of rifampin, now we're using four, for four months of rifampin. And of course, during this time period, you're looking at sensitivities because you want to be sure that you're using the proper drug for the this particular child. Um, and let's talk a little bit about infants, three months and under. Um, we do test any infant who's exposed, we test and evaluate any infant who's exposed to a TB case. They would receive the physical exam, the history, the, the, the skin test, and the chest x-ray, and be put on window prophylaxis. Now, we all question the validity of testing in such a young child. Why? Because their immune system is not that developed. So what you need to do is put the child on window prophylaxis and then retest the child, waiting until they're at least, if not three months, preferably older than that, before you do the second test. In fact, there have been instances where we have done three tuberculin skin tests just to be absolutely sure that we are not missing a baby who might be infected who just missed that window where they mounted a response. So it's certainly not an invasive test, a tuberculin skin test. It, it doesn't cause a lot of discomfort, and it gives you a lot of information uh, as to whether or not you would proceed uh, with further evaluation. And even and children this young, we, we, you do x-ray them. We have a lot of problems with um, private providers if the family chooses to go to them who do not x-ray children who've been exposed. We do want an x-ray on young children to be sure that we're not missing a child with TB disease. Okay, I think we have yeah. Can I introduce sure. something? One thing I want to mention too, if you're doing the second TST or IGRA, and initially the child was negative, and second go round, the testing is positive, you do need to repeat the x-ray. Because if you're planning to start the child on medication, you want to rule out TB disease and not use monotherapy. Right, Lillian, thank you for that comment because that's also something that I think people forget to do, that now you have a change in status. Now we know we have an infected child and therefore they, need, they deserve the full evaluation as you would have done right from the get-go if they were infected. Okay, so based on your based on your polling uh, answers, it looks like most of you out there are using nine months of INH, which is fine. Um, we have found, with the acceptance of four months of rifampin um, in children, that uh, we're getting very good adherence results. Um, we deal with families who often have a difficulty getting into clinic uh, to be seen and to get medication. So um, it's a distance. So we found that we have much better adherence with the four months of rifampin, and we are not seeing children come back with TB disease, so we feel comfortable. Of course, research is still going on to determine whether or not this is the best regimen. But certainly nine months of INH is acceptable to, to use. Okay, I'm just going to talk a, a little bit about um, the, the Stop TB Partnership has come up with medications, which unfortunately are not available to us yet here in the United States, but these are child-friendly medications. Uh, they're combination, uh, fixed-dose combinations, and they are fruit flavors and dissolve in water. So um, they're, they're being used in many countries around the world where it's difficult to get medications to children and to prepare them. So it's, it's really a, w a wonderful thing in countries where 
uh, TB is still a big problem, and it's so difficult to get medications into children. But unfortunately, we need FDA approval here in our country before we can uh, utilize such medication. So hopefully that's coming to us uh, in the near future. So let's talk about uh, TB pediatric regimens. Um, for TB infection, as we just discussed, it's either nine months of INH, four months of rifampin, or INH and rifapentine for 12 weeks by directly observed therapy. Um, I must admit to you that we do not, I do not have, and we do not have a lot of um, experience here using uh, the INH and rifapentine for 12 weeks because of resources to do the DOT uh, for the children. Uh, so we have really been using mo much more the rifampin for four months and, of course, for some children, the INH for nine months. Uh, for TB disease, the, with the first two months, we're using four drugs, INH, rifampin, PZA, and ethambutol, followed by an additional four months of INH and rifampin. I'm just going to talk for a moment about ethambutol because I know that a lot of people have concerns about uh, optic neuritis in children. And I can tell you that, um, and it's very difficult to do the eye uh, evaluation the, on, on young children, especially infants and, and toddlers. But we have not seen a case of optic neuritis in any of our patients. And I think one of the uh, recommendations I would give to you is that it's dose related. So we always use 15 milligrams per kilogram when we're using the ethambutol. And once we know sensitivities, if we know the isolate is pan-sensitive, we drop the ethambutol. So that's why it's so important to stay on top of the index case and the sensitivity uh, pattern. But we do use ethambutol, and we have used it safely uh, with our patients. We avoid using INH liquid because of the sorbitol that's in the, in the uh, formulation. Uh, it can cause uh, loose stools and, and cramping. Um, we use the INH tablets, and we can break them in half. We crush them. We dissolve them in a little bit of warm water and mix them with a little bit of food, and we do fine with that with babies. With infants we, who are breastfed, we add the uh, liquid, liquid um, pill that's been dissolved into a liquid form to some breast milk, put a nipple in the baby's mouth, and just pour the breast milk medication combination in, and the baby just sucks it down. It's so important, though, that you must dissolve the tablet so there's no granules, because the baby will retch if they feel granules on their tongue. Okay. <clears throat> so remember that the caregiver is very important um, in the administration of the medication. In directly as their therapy, if someone is watching, but in children, the caregiver, the parent or the grandparent or whoever cares for the child, is the one that's giving the medication. So adherence is very much determined by the caregiver. So we must look at all the barriers, and Lillian is going to go, go into in detail about barriers and how you can overcome the barriers uh, to, to giving these medications to children. So let's talk a little bit about medication side effects. I'm going to initiate my comments by saying that we rarely ever see secondary side effects to the medications uh, with our patients. And I, I feel like I'm speaking from experience. I've done this for 16 years, and I've seen literally several thousand children over this period of time. And I can assure you that children tolerate the medicines very, very well. But we must make our families feel comfortable about giving the medication. So of course, we go over the side of possible side effects. Um, so we go over if any I basically don't like to what I call lead the witness. I don't like to give them every specific side effect. I basically say if your child is not is feeling sick with the medication, not eating the way they used to, just not acting the way you know they normally act, give us a call and we'll see them right away. Of course, with rifampin, you must make the child aware that the urine will be orange and that they shouldn't panic and think that that's blood in their urine. So that's important before the child leaves the clinic, a child old enough to understand that. And we want the parents to feel comfortable calling if they have any questions or concerns so that we can treat this, the child successfully uh, throughout the whole course of treatment. And of course, the, the people going out into the field should be asking questions about how the patients 
are doing with the medication and then report that back uh, to the clinic. Uh, this is a picture of a child we recently saw uh, when the uh, worker, when the healthcare worker went out to the home, the mother reported the child had a terrible rash. And I don't know how well you can see, but you can see some redness, especially below the knees and above you can see. So it, was, it gave, when we saw this, because with the use of now with everybody having a smartphone, it was a great idea for her to snap a picture and bring it into the clinic. So we looked at it. And we, of course, we did see the child, but we weren't concerned that this was a life-threatening situation by any means. And that was really the, the purpose of seeing the picture uh, before we saw the child. So we knew that we didn't have to, it wasn't an emergency where they need to emergently go for a health care appraisal. So when we saw the child, it turned out to be that the child had been out on the weekend playing in the grass. and these were definitely bug bites uh, that the child was experiencing. But unfortunately, people make correlations because they're taking the medication. Anything that happens to the child, they correlate to the medication. Again, that's up to the nurse and the physician or whoever is providing the care to decide and to help the parent realize that the medication is safe and to allay their fears about the possibilities of side effects. Okay, these are growth charts, one for boys and one for girls. We feel very, very strongly that weight should be monitored at every visit because in children, weight of a child is a very good parameter of how they're doing. And a healthy child should not be losing weight. So certainly if they're stable or they gained a half a pound or whatever, they're not going to be gaining pounds. We don't want that. But we want to see that the child is moving ahead on their growth chart. And for all our cases, we do put growth charts in their chart so that we can monitor that they're doing better over time and that they're recovering from their TB disease. The children who have maybe having a problem may alert us to should we do liver enzymes on this child? Is something else going on in the home? It opens it up to more questions, better history taking, more involvement of the family, finding out what are the causes. Sometimes it might be a, a child who just immigrated to the country who's not used to the food. We had that with one child, or a child just doesn't feel comfortable in school eating the school lunch. So it just may take a little more time, but it's important to get to the bottom of why a child's weight is not progressing or at least stable. And also, if a child is gaining too much weight, it also opens that up to what's going on nutritionally. Is the child uh, receiving enough exercise? It, in the TV clinic, it's a good opportunity to do a lot of anticipatory guidance. Many of these children don't have primary care providers, and I find it an opportunity to intervene with a lot of general pediatric issues. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me to present this afternoon. Suzanne, excellent job. Um, I always like to start off with this comment. Think of what we teach our children at a very young age. We teach our children not to talk to strangers, not to um, take any food from strangers, basically to ignore strangers. Yet, think of our role in public health when we're going into a home for a newly diagnosed patient. So I want you all to keep that in mind. Second thing to keep in mind is that a child is not a small adult. And in certain situations, as Suzanne pointed out, and I hope to give you examples, the child has to be dealt with differently. I'm going to give you some general guidelines for medication administration. What I always say to the clinicians, okay, you've done the job of evaluating the child, prescribing the medication. Now the difficult piece comes into play, administering the medication to the child. So hopefully some of the things I discuss with you will be helpful. One thing we recommend is trying to keep to the same time every day. Children really respond to a regular routine. Um, I've had a lot of success with teenagers on treatment for latent TB infection, suggesting that, and just last night I recommended it to a young lady, suggesting that they keep their bottle of medicine in a glass along with their toothbrush. So when they're going to bed at night, when they brush their teeth, they can take the medicine. I only had in all my years, 20 years experience, one teenager tell me he didn't brush his teeth at night. So hopefully this is a good recommendation. Things like starting off on a positive note. You have to be positive with children. You have to be enthusiastic. 
you have to really avoid any kinds of distractions. I was dealing with a young toddler who had an attention deficit disorder. When I went to the home to really evaluate what was going on with medication administration, which the mother was giving, the problem was that she was trying to medicate the child in the living room with a television on, with multiple family members coming in and out of the room. So I made a recommendation that we take the child into a back room and see how that would work. Took him to the back room. He was able to take the medication with no problem and was able to follow through and really complete his treatment. You also want to ignore behaviors that may be interfering with medication administration. If on your first try you're successful, I'm, I will be very surprised. It does take time with children. So you really have to understand the child, understand some of the behavior, um, and really work through this type of behavior along with the parents. And sometimes when you're assessing the problems, Sometimes part of the problem could be the family member. We have situations where the grandmother was the caregiver in the family, and when the nurse would go to administer the medication, the grandmother was more interfering with the medication administration. And being able to identify that and present it to the family, we were able to resolve the situation by going later in the day when the parents were there for medication administration. Suzanne, I think, touched on this. Things we try to do, we really avoid the liquids. What we tend to do is crush the pills, um, open capsules, and mix it with a food vehicle that, is, um, that the child would like to use. Not all children like applesauce. I've learned that the hard way. There are different foods that you may want to use to mix the medication with. Um, Suzanne's recommendation of mixing it with a small amount of warm water works very well because it dissolves all the granules and makes it easier to mix with the food that where the child isn't really tasting the medication. You want to use the smallest amount of food possible. And we do a little trick here where we put the medication in the food vehicle, we give it to the child, then the next spoonful of uh, medication is really without the medication, it's really the food. So you're alternating food with medication versus the food. And that has worked very well for most of our patients. The other thing I would recommend to parents is whatever food vehicle you are using, try to limit use of it during the rest of the week. Just use it that you're using it for the medication, where it's more like a treat for the child. And an example you'll see in a slide later is a young child, a two-year-old who had multi-drug resistant TB, which was identified from a contact investigation. The mother was the index case. And we were able to get, which was amazing to me, PAS and ethionamide in the child, mixing it with whipped cream. He would look forward to our visit where he, he would be getting the medication. We went over some of this. I think Suzanne explained it um, very well about mixing the medication in with breast milk or formula, putting it in the nipple of the bottle, and having the child take the medication mixed with the formula. You need to keep in mind, you want to schedule it at a time when the child is hungry. Point being made, if a child has just eaten and then you're coming in to administer the medication, it may not work. Same thing has occurred with children that are taking a nap and you're coming in right after nap time. Not all children are pleasant when they wake up from their nap and you may have a difficult time with medication administration. Um, also, we don't use that often, but we have used oral syringes and they are beneficial. We had a child last week who was giving us a difficult time, actually a TB case, a two-year-old, with medication administration. The mother had suggested that she felt that the oral syringe would be helpful. She came into clinic and was able to administer the medication using the oral syringe, squirting it to the side of the cheek, and the child took it well, but he was still fighting a little bit. She, her child was in the previous picture um, that Suzanne showed. He came in yesterday, and currently now he takes the syringe and squirts it in his mouth himself. So you do make progression with time. Um, rarely do we have to use, and I really want to stress this, drastic measures. 
such as an NG tube or a gastrostomy tube to administer the medications. We have, in all the years I've been here, never had to use this process. We are able to identify food vehicles, times, and ways to administer the medication. And I want to stress, I know our pediatricians used to always say it takes about two, about two weeks for the child to get comfortable with you and um, where it becomes less of a struggle to administer the medication. This is a famous picture, tools of the trade. This is very important. You can crush the medication between the two spoons, and you can see here using a fresh banana and mixing the medication with the banana. Now, I have to tell you, in clinic, we don't have the luxury of having sometimes the spoons, so you can use other things. I've been known to use a stapler, where you can hammer the medication in an envelope, or um, a coffee mug where you use the handle and use the coffee mug to hammer the medication in an envelope. Once you get it crushed like that, mixing it, like Suzanne stated, with the warm water really dissolves it. And the parents definitely can see a difference with medication administration. This next slide I love. This was a nurse in uh, the southern part of our state that was having a very difficult time with a young child with medication administration. She sent me this picture, and I, I was just blown away that she was able to do this. She crushed up the medication. You can see right there in the medication cup. And then what she did is crush uh, milk chocolate, let it cool the chocolate. You don't want it really hot. And then made lollipops for the child with the medication in it. And that child was able to complete the treatment. So being, you have to be really creative. You want to assess barriers with parents, because sometimes um, that can be an obstacle. We've noted on several occasions, and Suzanne can attest to this, sometimes the parent isn't in charge of the situation, where the child is, quote, running the show. You really have to get the parents and the family involved. The parents have to take charge, work with, with their child, and eventually, Hopefully, it will work that the child will be able to take the med medication. You want to motivate the parents. You want to praise not only the child, but also the family. Um, tell them what a good job they're doing. Um, maybe motivate them. We've used in certain situations with TB cases where the parent is not seeing the child as being sick and really doesn't understand why the child was identified as a TB case. We've taken families into our x-ray reading room to actually look at the x-ray where the clinician, the provider will actually show them the x-ray and explain what's going on. Um, that has helped in many situations. But I mean working not just with the child but also with the family. You have to keep in mind that many of our patients are coming from countries, as Suzanne explained, endemic countries where people die from tuberculosis. So you really have to really work hard to explain that we have treatment here. TB is treatable. TB is curable. And then you also have to look at compelling life circumstances. If you have a family where the family members are working two jobs, they may have a difficult time keeping up with clinic appointments. Um, you may have to be flexible with your schedule. This is where I think it's important to utilize the video DOT. Technology can come into play where it can assist you with some of these barriers. Um, we seem to see situations with some of our adolescents that are very active in after-school activities. So that really has to be worked out between you, the child, and the family. Are you going to do it later in the day? Or are you going to do it at school? And maybe in those situations, video DOT would be helpful. Next picture just really shows you um, the idea of adherence. Here is a young child, and this is actually latent TB infection, where the child and the father were involved with the treatment. And this was interesting because when we first got this little guy, we always had to crush the pill. It always had to be crushed, mixed with certain foods. And keep in mind, if you're using a certain food vehicle for, say, two to three months, and the child's taking it with no problem, and then all of a sudden you're starting to have issues with the child taking the medication, that's a clue to you to switch the food you're using. But this young man came to clinic and actually wanted to show us that he was very grown up and was able to actually take the pill and swallow the pill. And my field workers were very happy. 
Oh, another thing with the medication. When you're preparing the medication, it should be done in the home to be mixed with the food. We don't know what, what could happen to the medication being mixed prior to delivering to the home. So that's important to keep in mind. That's why when the families are in clinic, we are showing the families how to crush and administer the medicine. This is the young boy I talked about earlier, the MDR case. And here the mother is administering the medication under DOT supervision. I want to stress that. The nurses, the public health workers really aren't there to administer. They're there to watch the mother administer the medicine and assist her. And I'm telling you, this young man loved the whipped cream and we never had a problem. And this was a young man who also had um, a port, a central line that we worked with. Now you have a polling question. If the child vomits after giving the medication, what would you do? You all are extremely smart. You do not re-administer the medication and don't count the dose. Um, you don't know how much the child had received when you were giving the medication. Now, remember I said earlier, there's a difference between spitting up and vomiting. Spitting up is going to occur immediately. It usually has to do with the taste of the medication. Vomiting would occur later on, maybe one or two, more like two hours after the medication has been administered. So there is a difference. Um, additional factors that could affect adherence is actually the length of the medication treatment. I think Suzanne had a good point. We're using more four months for FAMP and, and that's working very well. The relationship of the caregiver or person administering the medication. Like I said, the grandmother in one situation was the obstacle. Once she was removed and other family members were involved, we had no more problems with medication administration. <laughs> medication side effects. Vomiting versus spitting up, we discussed, and about not re-administering the medicine. Now, I just want to point out, not all vomiting is due to medication. This occurred actually last week. We got a call from a mother stating that her daughter, who was a teenager in high school, was having some problems early in the morning. She was taking the medicine, and then later on vomiting. She had missed some school, and she was very concerned. I advised her to hold the medicine and bring the child in immediately for an evaluation. She brought her daughter in. We did blood work, all her liver enzymes, everything was okay. When we questioned the mother further, the pediatrician came out and he said, she's still vomiting even without getting the medication. So we were able to talk with the adolescent and question what's going on. Came to find out that she was being bullied in school it, and was felt very stressed out in the morning. Just the thought of having to go to school was very upsetting to her. So we made the recommendation that the medicine be given in the evening, but that was the least of the problems. The bullying was the issue. So we also have to get the school counselor involved to see what's going on because that can't continue. Switching the medicine to the evening worked well. She has had no problems with taking the medicine and currently she is getting counseling and she's getting assistance in school. So point being that the reactions of others, you have to be positive and you have to really investigate. That's what I like about this job. It's like detective work. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one thing. Lillian brought up a very important point about holding the medication. I know very often people are very concerned about holding the medication. Um, I can tell you that First of all, when there are other issues, other variables that may be affecting whether or not the parent believes that the medication is causing a problem, it's the best thing, like she said with the girl with the vomiting, to hold the TV meds and then you can kind of decipher what's going on here. When you still have the meds being given, you, it's hard to come to a conclusion. So it's okay to hold TV meds for a couple of days so you figure out what the problem is and it really helps to clear up what the issues are. So I think that was an important point that you made. Uh, remember with TB treatment, it's dosing over time. Right. So that a, a dose missed here or there, certainly we don't want to miss doses. 
We want to get the treatment over, over with as quickly as possible in the correct time frame. But when problems arise, it's not a major issue to hold TB meds for a couple of days, a day or two, to try to figure out what's going on with the child. Okay, um, these are some strategies for different age groups on how to give the medication. Certainly with an infant, it's all about the parent or caregiver. They, they have to understand why we're doing the treatment, because remember, we have a new baby here, and nobody wants to give medications to a baby. So we have to make sure that the caregiver, the parent, is on board in understanding why the treatment is ne necessary, and also to alleviate parents' fears about medication. That's one of the most often questions we get with, with infants and very young children about whether the medication is going to harm their child either currently or in the future. And you must take the time to make parents feel comfortable because they're giving the medication and they certainly don't want to harm their own child. So remember that, especially in the infants. Okay, how do we get the medication into toddlers? Well, like Lillian said, using distraction, whether it's a toy or music. I mean, Lillian and I have often <laughs> sung together uh, to try to, and it works even though we're not very good singers. <laughs> and we've blown bubbles in clinics. Anything, right, anything. And, and just simply explain things and use incentives. Like she said, get bubbles, little toys. Our nurses are wonderful. They buy little uh, dime store uh, treats for the children, bubbles, um, little uh, stickers, anything so that they get a reward. And toddlers do respond to that. Um, with preschoolers, you have to do a little more explaining. Uh, you have to make sure that they understand what's going on in a very simple way. Um, and usually, you know, and do things quickly. You know, people take too much time. And the longer you take, sometimes the worse the situation gets. So the best thing is to move quickly and efficiently, properly, for blood drawing or medication administration, properly holding the child so they're not flailing and kicking and doing whatever and getting the job done because, as I tell all the parents, this is our only tool to cure TB or to prevent TB is using this medication. Lots of sunshine and good food are great, but they're not going to cure TB, as we know. With an older child, again, simple explanation um, and ex giving them some autonomy as to maybe when they take their medication, understanding that they have lives and they have schedules and addressing that so that they can do what they want to do with their life, like school activities, and understanding that they're not always going to want to do what you want to do, but making it clear that this is what we need to do to, to cure them. Now, with adolescents, a lot of that is involving them in decision making, again, about when they take their medication, how it affects school, and confidentiality is so important in this age group. Most of these kids don't even want to have the medication given in school because they don't want anybody else to know that they're taking. Why are you going to the school nurse? What is that about? So sometimes we've had workers meet the child outside the school on their way home and they take their medication um, because maybe they're going somewhere else or they have something else to do. Um, so we've, like Lillian said before, you do what you have to do to work with the family, work with the child to get them to take their medication. And with the older kids, you know, you want to use real rewards, maybe a gift card, um, maybe um, some kind of things that they like, maybe a, a movie, pass, movie pass, pass, right, things like that. So we try to, again, work with each kid and try to address their individual needs. Just to tack on to what Suzanne said briefly, we were, when I was doing school-based DOT with the adolescents, they were definitely having a problem uh, getting the students to come at lunchtime to take their medication. The school nurse would arrange it and they wouldn't show. So the school nurse invited me to the school to really see what was going on. When I met with some of the students, the big issue was they didn't want to go at lunchtime. That's their one free period. They didn't want to be bogged down with waiting for the nurse to give them the medication. So we had a meeting, I worked with the school nurse, and what she was able to work out is that she would medicate the students in the morning when they first arrived at school. And to accommodate the treatment, she would bring food. So they'd have a, what we call the breakfast club. And they'd come in the morning, they'd get some food to eat, they'd sit around and talk, 
talk, so it was a peer support group, and then they get their medication. Now, patient-centered care, this is from the new treatment guidelines. And I'm glad to see they have incorporated case management and patient involvement. What they're stating in the new guidelines is that the case manager, together with the patient and other health care providers, develop and manage the patient's plan of care, working together. I know we here at our clinic have made an emphasis on working with, especially with our children, keeping in communication with the private providers. That's very important. Patients should be involved in a meaningful way of making decisions concerning their treatment, and Suzanne explained that. You know, deciding where do they want DOT. They want it in school, do they want it at home, after school, whatever. Um, you want to have the least rest restrictive public health interventions that will help you to achieve treatment, balancing the rights of the patients with the um, health of the community. So this is important. It's really patient-centered care. And this correlates with what we've started to initiate here at our clinic is family-centered care. We recently were able to have our pediatrician is a med-peds physician. So he is able to see both adults and children. This has been wonderful because it enables families to come as a family unit to receive the care. Families like it, it's easier for us. Um, it limits the number of visits that the family has to make. Um, it provides dignity and respect because you're listening to the parent and the children. You're working together. Information sharing, this is where it's been really beneficial so that everyone's getting the same information. And then the family can go home and discuss it as a family unit. Um, the patient and the family are able to support each other in decision making so that it, it, it's done along with the provider. And um, it's just really been very beneficial here. We have a couple of families where the parent is the TB case, the children have been identified as contacts, some are on, as Suzanne explained, window prophylaxis, some are converters and are on medication. And by having the whole family together, you can see the collaboration and they're working together and you're able to solve problems and it's just worked very well. Now, this next picture shows collaboration between the public health nurse, you can see in the picture on the uh, left, with the mother and the child who was a TB case. This was a child that was very difficult to get the medication in. The nurse called me one day and said, he's running all over the apartment. I'm chasing him. So we had some discussion along with the mother, and what we came up with is the idea of role playing. Children like that. I know my four-year-old granddaughter loves to feed her little dollies, so I thought maybe let's get a, 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 the child involved in some role playing. So what the nurse did, the public health nurse, went out and purchased, it was around the holidays, the little Grinch. And what ended up happening is that the child who was the TB patient would take his medicine first from his mom, and then he would take a spoon and take some of the food and feed the Grinch, and then he'd take his medicine again. We were able to get this child through treatment using the Grinch as one of the team players. Directly observed therapy involves a healthcare or outreach worker watching as a patient swallows their anti-TB medications. So we know that DOT is the standard of care for TB disease. So this is very important that this is established and that patients and families understand because oftentimes the parent's first response is, of course I'm going to give my child their medication. I want my child to be well. And we always tell them, we understand that and we respect that. However, we need to document that your child has taken all their medication so that we feel comfortable and confident all patients have the same treatment. It's, it's not specific for any particular age group or, or where you live. All of our patients are treated this way and this is done worldwide. So we know that it's effective. So, and you know what, eventually, parents and, and look forward to the worker coming to their home. They develop relationships. And um, 
it works out usually to be a very good thing. So here is polling question. All right. Oh. So where can DOT be done? It can be done in the home or at the home of a babysitter, in the daycare, in the school, at the health department, where someone works, in a vehicle, in a car, or now we're seeing video DOT being done. We had one girl last year um, who was very involved in school activities, and she did not want to have to be home when the person came to her house. So we did video DOT with her, and it, was, it worked out marvelously. And I think that's going to be the wave of the future. Um, so it's certainly we have to be innovative when we talk about doing directly observed therapy. And our, our practice here is to do it throughout the course of treatment. Um, and it worked out very well for us doing it that way. And we've never had a treatment failure. So we, we're sticking with it. I think in the car is interesting because this was a situation where we were constantly having a difficult time with medicating the child. And when you start questioning and working with the family, one comment that was made is he's so good when we take him for rides in the car. So a decision was made that we would do the DOT by the public health nurse while the parent drove around in the car. And once we solved that situation, we're able to medicate him in the car, he was able to complete treatment. Directly observed therapy can be supervised from all the people, and I'm not going to read it listed above. It should not be supervised by a parent or close family member. And can I tell you, in some instances, at one point I actually used a classroom teacher um, that was able to medicate a child in first grade because when the child went to the school nurse, he, w he was giving her a difficult time and the school nurse was having a difficult time. So the teacher got involved and she said, you know, I think I could help you with this. So the teacher actually supervised the DOT. See, nothing is set. There's no fixed solution with working with children. You have to really work with the child, the family, and the situation negotiating the plan for DOT. I think we've gone over this. You're working with the family and the child. They all have to be part of the DOT process. You have to really maintain and have a good rapport with the family and with the child. Like I said, last night, impressed, yesterday impressed me so much when the child was able to squirt the medication from the syringe into his mouth. I'm just going to discuss uh, doing directly observed therapy in the school setting, some basics. First of all, we need the parental consent. Now, every school district will have their own forms and regulations relative to giving medication in school. So when you get involved with this, you need to find out what those necessities are in the school setting, what paperwork has to be signed before you can initiate the directly observed therapy in the school. But no matter what the papers are, we would need some sort of a log so that the clinic would get the information in writing when the child took their medication. Now, when we're using the school nurse, um, oftentimes we do um, twice a week therapy, especially you know, if we're diseased after a month or so of treatment. And with uh, latent TB infection, we could initiate it after a couple of weeks to be sure the child tolerates the medication, and this usually works very, very well. But it's important to get that information from the school nurse about adherence and intervene very quickly when you find out that there's not good adherence. And secondly, you need to get a school calendar because you want to know when the school is closed so that you can uh, get the medication to the child if there's a long vacation. Or if the child's out sick, there needs to be communication between the school and the uh, nurse in the clinic or the uh, DOT worker. So everybody has to work together to get this done. But I can tell you, and Lillian also did lots and lots of school uh, DOT. We, years ago, before we had IGRAS, we know we were treating way more children than were infected, but we had no choice. We had positive skin tests. We offered treatment to children when they were in, had a positive test. 
So we had numbers of children in the school setting taking medication. And we really worked very well with school nurses. We went out and did in-services so everybody understood that we could answer their questions. So it, it is an option for getting the medication to the child if it works in your particular area. So there are different things, like I said, about your particular area. Maybe there's more than one school that a school nurse is covering. Maybe there's no backup coverage. I know in some states they don't even have school nurses. Um, about school schedules, you know, maybe they won't, some schools won't allow a child out of class. So you have to understand what's going on in each particular uh, situation. And also about uh, communication between the nurse and the school. Oftentimes parents are so worried when they bring the child in about absences. And we've made sure that all the schools we partner with do not count the children absent for coming in to be seen by the uh, doctor or, or the nurse practitioner so that children don't uh, accrue absences that they don't need to accrue. And sometimes kids do miss a whole day of school because they're traveling to and from the clinic. So we try to keep those visits at a minimum, but we do need to see the children to monitor, monitor them through their treatment. Just to tack on to that, I wanted to say, Susanna and I also got involved with rewarding the school nurses. So you would send them little thank you notes, or I know at the holidays we'd buy them like boxes of candy, or um, just to acknowledge the work that they're doing. Because when you would approach the school nurse, they would always say, I I'm doing so much. I have so much medication to administer. So once you start acknowledging you know, their effort to assist you, it, it is very helpful. Now this slide, you've seen this young man many times, the toddler who was the multi-drug resistant uh, case. He was identified during the contact investigation of his mother who was an MDR case. Sensitivities match, their isolates match, so he was treated with second line drugs similar to his mother. And he's, he was treated for 18 to 24 months because he's MDR. And, um, He's a child that Suzanne actually arranged. We initially started doing, he had infusion therapy, and I think the next slide will show you that. That's the mother doing the infusion. He, um, yeah, there he is. He had a port in place, because ports are much, I think, uh, easier to handle in a toddler, less likely to able to pull it or remove it or, or even, you know, get involved with touching it. So he had a port. And we had the child, first attempt we did, we had the child come in with the mother, and we were going to do the infusion therapy in the clinic. We figured, oh, this is great. Um, did not work well at all. So then Suzanne worked with an infusion company to arrange for infusion therapy at home. Um, I remember because Suzanne and I made the joint visit to the home to assess what was going on, and the infusion company was very helpful with setting up the infusion. But their plan, and it actually worked, was to teach this young single mother how to do the infusion. And I have to tell you, she did an excellent job. She would initiate the infusion therapy. The child would have a ball with the amicacin in it. He could wear his regular clothes, stick it in his pocket of his clothes, walk around, play, do whatever he wanted to do. Um, the worker would come to the home while the infusion was going on to, to administer the PO meds, which were given with the whipped cream. He got through treatment beautifully, and the mother did an excellent job in terms of doing the infusion. So it worked out very well, and both of them were able to complete treatment. Okay, this, this next slide is a very interesting case. Um, this child, as a very young toddler, you can see her there, she's about 15 months old at the time, was brought to us because she had uh, wheezing episodes that weren't being alleviated by uh, the usual treatment for reactive airway disease. So when she came to us, our doctor was an infectious disease doctor, and that's how she got to us. And I don't think anybody uh, with the referral was actually thinking TB, but they didn't know what to do. So sent to, the, to us uh, to be seen by the infectious disease doctor. When we did a chest x-ray, um, there were infiltrates, but when our very astute pediatric radiologist was viewing the chest x-ray, 
what she noticed behind the heart, where of course the spinal column is, is that there was a spinal abscess. So not only did this little girl have pulmonary TB, which was causing her wheezing episodes, but she also had POTS disease with a huge spinal abscess. Now mind you, this kid, when she came to clinic, was running all over the place, looked perfectly fine, except for her history of wheezing, was happy, was playful. You would never and ever think that she had such serious disease. So as you can see on the left there, the child had to be admitted to the hospital. We had to get neurosurgery involved, which was quite um, a situation because the neurosurgeon, the pediatric neurosurgeon, was very concerned about how do I know this is tuberculosis? How do I know that what's in this abscess is not some other organism? So although we were convinced what we needed to do was to get our team moving immediately to get the family members in so we could find out what was, how was this child infected. Somebody in the home had to be had infected this little girl. And sure enough, when the family came in, I saw the father from the back and his pants were hanging. And I said, it's got to be him. He obviously had lost a lot of weight and that's consequently his pants weren't fitting him. Sure enough, he was the index case and we were able to convince the uh, neurosurgeon not to go in because, again, a very, very tricky procedure to go in and try to drain some fluid, some, I guess, pus from that abscess to identify what was the uh, organism. He agreed that we would start treatment, but we had, he had, she had to be put into a halo to stabilize her spine. That's how, how terrible this abscess was. And um, we were able to initiate treatment, and she did beautifully. She did absolutely beautifully, and I think the next slide will show you. Um, there she is as a younger child, and there she is now as a teenager. She has absolutely no deficits. She can, um, has no neurologic problems. There are no uh, motor skills that were affected, all because of excellent, excellent medical care and also excellent job by the TB clinic people getting the family in, working as fast as we could to initiate treatment and find out, how, you know, properly diagnose and treat this child. So it really, when people say it takes a village, it takes a team of experts and uh, people working with you to get the job done because had we not seen this child when we did, she probably would have been paralyzed probably from the chest down um, because the abscess was compromising her spinal cord. So it's, it's really a, a blessing to see her as such a beautiful, healthy young girl today. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian and Suzanne. That was a fantastic presentation. We're now going to open up uh, the floor for some questions and um, chat. Please stick around because after that we will have our, uh, another opportunity for you to type in your email address and collect some of the resources from the screen. And if you type in your email address, um, I will send you some additional resources. I think we got the rest of it. Oh, in targeted testing, what do you consider a recent immigrant? Okay, well, we're talking to you from New Jersey, so uh, the schools have guidelines um, about children who are first entering the school system. Those children from endemic countries need to be tested. But let's suppose we're seeing a two-year-old that came within the year from India, let's say. That would be considered a, a recent immigrant. Now, suppose we saw someone that was in the country for five years. Now, the risk is much lower after you've been in the country for a while. So again, the clinician can make a decision. I mean, there's got to be a reason why the child was referred to you. So again, it may be because of the school, and then maybe because the private practitioner placed a TB test on a child. Um, so when you get the history, if they're from an endemic country and they haven't been evaluated upon entrance to the country, then they deserve an evaluation. But the farther they are from coming to the country, let's say more than five years, the less likely they are of uh, developing disease because we know that most people develop TB disease within the first two years of being infected and especially in young children. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Are there any foods that should not be mixed with TB medication? Um, 
I'd like to answer that. Actually, no. <laughs> there aren't any foods that you you shouldn't mix with the TB medicine. When I first started here at the Global TB Institute in Pediatrics, I had a long discussion with, at the time, Mike Eisman from National Jewish. He clearly stated to me, any way you can get the medication in the child, do it. And I know literature out there says don't mix with this, don't mix with that. We, we haven't had a problem. We've mixed the medication with many different food vehicles. And I think what Lillian had said earlier about not mixing the medication with anything anytime before you administer. In other words, the food and the medicine right. should be mixed at the time and of your administration. administration. So you can't mix the medication in the clinic because we don't know what effect, right. let's say, an acidic food might have on the medication about breaking down the components. So the efficacy of the medication might be an issue. Um, I can't, I don't know if there's any literature that really looked at that. There was old literature about cautioning, like Lillian right. said, about using sugary foods. Sugary, yeah. But we have not seen that to be a problem. No. We've never had um, a failure, a treatment no. failure, nor have we had a child who completed treatment for LTBI come back with TB disease because we used a certain food vehicle. So based on our experience and what's available thus far in the literature, we would say no, that there aren't any foods right. that you can't use. Um, I see there's a question about the use of rifampin in very young children, and we've actually asked ourselves the same question. Um, in very young children, like infants and toddlers, we have been using the INH, um, unless the if it's a contact and the isolate is a resistant INH, then we have used have to use rifampin. But you can open the rifampin capsule and mix it in food. Um, but we haven't used um, the rifampin in infants, like as, as LTBI treatment. We can, uh, the physician I work with has continued to recommend that we continue to use the INH. However, I can't imagine that it would be a problem because it is an effect, it's shown to be effective. And are small children treated four months or six months with rifampin for LTBI? We, we've been using four months. Yeah. Um, earlier we were using six months because there wasn't a lot of data about four months, but I think there's enough information extrapolated from adult literature that four months works and we've been using four months with good success. Do you use rifampin four months for infants if they're contact? Um, as I said, we haven't been. We've been using the INH. However, if the isolate comes back resistant to INH, then we use the rifampin. Please explain the need to repeat the chest x-ray if one was done initially before the window treatment was initiated. The reason for that is when you're doing the retesting and the result is positive, you want to rule out any active disease process because if you're giving monotherapy to a child that you're noting on the x-ray has TB disease, you, you, it, you'd be doing a disservice. So you really have to repeat the x-ray, make sure there's no active disease process occurring so that you can give the monotherapy. Okay. And, uh, I, I, go ahead. <laughs> Did you have something else? I see there's a question about fluoroquinolones in milk. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah. You know, I really don't have the answer to that. I'd have to, you know, we we use fluoroquinolones. Um, I guess there must be an issue with milk, but I'm not really aware. So I can't really intelligently answer that question. Right. And then there's another question um, that About during the presentation, it was mentioned that sometimes the student does not want DOT with the school nurse, or the DOT worker will meet the student outside when the school lets out. How are the DOT logs being signed? Is there no need for an adult to be present, or is this just an exception? We don't have any rules or regulations no. about an adult being pregnant, present yeah. uh, with a, a child. And most of the times, these are teenagers. Right. In fact, we allow, uh, as long as the parent signs the permission, permission, we allow the teenagers to come in to be seen in the clinic without an adult. Oh, because again, right. we want to see these kids and we want to make it as easy as possible. So as long as we have parental permission, we give the children their medication without an adult present, yes. And sometimes our workers um, go into the school, into the school nurse's office, and administer the medication rather than
the school nurse administering the medication. And that works, that seems to work very well. Yeah, I, I, go ahead. When children are uh, treated for active disease, can they go to two times a week in phase two? I think they meet the, uh, the, the continuation phase. Yes. Yes. Yes, we, could, we can go down to twice a week. I mean, as long as we have our sensitivities and um, there's no reason why we wouldn't go down to twice a week. I see there's a question there about when we don't have an isolate, do we treat the child with uh, four drugs and two? Our, we have not. We, because we don't have an isolate, we have treated children with four drugs for the six months when we don't know the isolate. Right. Because, it, again, what we said earlier, they tolerate the medication without ill effects. They, as long as they're thriving, they're gaining weight, they have no complaints, we feel much more comfortable using four drugs for six months just in case there might be resistance. Because when we don't have an isolate, and sometimes in some of these kids we don't, um, then we, we go ahead and use four drugs for the entire course of treatment. And then I see the question about 3-HP and its use in the pediatric uh, population. Um, I have to say, we've used it more here with adolescents, but I know in New York City, um, they are using it in children too and above the 3-HP. Um, we haven't had that experience, so I really can't comment, but it works well under directly observed therapy with the adolescents. And you know, since we have now are using with confidence four months of rifampin, so we only have one drug for four months, I'm always a little hesitant to use two drugs in a child that we can use one drug okay. and get the same result. And then for four months, and if we feel they're being adherent to treatment, especially in the very young children, we, we have not uh, gone to using the rifapentine. Okay, and I see a question that CDC don't, doesn't re recommend two times a week in the continuation phase. I guess in the new recommendations that just came, recently yes. just came out, but three times that's a, week a recommendation, there. so I guess that's yeah. something that's gonna be determined by whoever's doing the treatment for right, right. moving forward. I like who commented on that, though. You can see you're reading the regulations, because I agree with Patty. When I saw that, I was a little taken back, because we've been doing twice weekly. But yes, they, they're saying three times a week. And I can tell you from experience that in all our cases, we, haven't, we right. really haven't gone to that in the children. I think that's more yeah. in the ad older, in the adult right. population and maybe in the teenagers. Um, but for the most part with the kids, we've been sticking, because I'm always afraid that they're going to have a problem with the higher doses and they're going to complain about stomach aches and right. whatnot. Now, certainly the rifampin may not change, but the INH certainly changes. So our experience has been to do the, the five days a week of directly right. served therapy. So, but thank you for pointing out the new yeah. guidelines. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and I think some of that is if they're missing doses, then you know if right. you if they're twice a week and they're missing doses, it's not a good regimen. But right. if they're not missing doses, then that's why we have DOT. Um, that's a great segue into uh, upcoming webinars that we will be having on the guidelines. Um, no, there is one November fourth and I think December 9th, But if you, uh, we will send you that information, and that'll be coming out shortly. Um, all right, I think if we are using INH or FAMPA regimen for three to four months for children less than four months. Yes, George, look, yes. You mean the I, you mean for LTBI, INH, and FAMPA? No. I'm, I'm a little confused. Regimen. Yeah, is that the question? Are you using INH and FAMPA regimen for three or four months for children less than four months? Is that, is that for LTBI, four years, four years old? But is it LTBI or active disease, I guess that is the question. That's why I'm confused. Yeah. Um, um, as I said earlier, and the, like that's a, for children less, than, children less than four months of age, I'm confused. Uh, for the very young children, we haven't been using the rifampin, the, the infants and very young toddlers. We've been sticking with the INH. Because it's tried and true. Window, window prophylaxis, but well, oh. again, with that, like if there, if the index case is re resistant, right, you're going to have to use rifampin in right. a child. But right, um, right. So. If, if we don't know, if we don't have our sensitivities in very young children, we start off with I and H. Um, once we get the sensitivities, because it's window prophylaxis, we probably would stick with the I and H right. in the real young kids, 
And the older kids, we are using the rifampin. And I think you just answered that. If you do not have an isolate on, on a child, can you treat as according to sensitive yes. of index? Sensitive that's, that's, index. We're fairly confident that the child was infected by that index case. We certainly go ahead and use those um, sensitivities. Now, we, we, when we don't have an index case and we have a young child, we do our best to get a specimen. You know, in the very young children, we do gastric aspirates. If we have an older child that we can get sputum from, we try to get the sputum. But we certainly try our best if we can get an ice, uh, a specimen to, to test for uh, sensitivities. We certainly do that. So if we have a baby that comes to us diagnosed with TB, we usually admit them if we don't have an index case and uh, do gastric aspirates. Right. So we, are, we make every attempt to get a specimen. So um, I guess we're getting to the end of our time shortly, so I'm going to um, go to our closing remarks. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email me, um, Patty Woods, patty.woods at Rutgers.edu, and it'll be at the end of this slide, and I will make sure that your questions are forwarded to the appropriate um, presenter and answered. But we have one last time for all your resources here. Uh, your sign-in sheets, please email or fax back to us so we know who uh, listened to the webinar and who is in the room if they didn't sign, uh, get to log in. We have our evaluation survey that we really encourage you to please take because we really like your feedback. Um, and again, if you would like to listen to this at a later date, it will be, archi it will be archived uh, shortly. Just remember that we do have TV con um, cons... <laughs> We have a TB consultation, and our information line is 1-800-4-TB-DOCS. But I'm laughing because it's not just for TB docs, it's also for nurses. So feel free to call if you'd like to at 1-800-482-3627, or uh, we have our email address. But if you have any additional questions, then you uh, want to either email us or, you know, later on down the road, you can always use that information line. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and all the other social media that is out there that we belong to. Um, and again, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email them to me and I will make sure that your questions are getting answered. I'd like to um, take a minute to thank Patty for inviting Suzanne and I and for assisting with the slides. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Patty. Patty. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you. And to everyone else, have a great afternoon. The leader has disconnected. The conference will now end. The leader has ended the meeting. Goodbye.